thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It is Veter Veterinarians, National Veterinarians Day, so um, we do want to acknowledge all our veterinarians. So thank you for being the heroes in our pets' lives and for your de dedication and commitment to what you do every day. Where Zorn is definitely proud to be a part of that. I um, mean, that shows in why Dr. Sarman is here. And I know Jackie Besovich is on the call as well. We're passionate about what we do and we're very passionate about supporting what you do out there as well. So um, our speaker tonight is Dr. Sue McTaggart um, from Dean Park Pet Hospital in North Saanich, British Columbia. And Dr. Sarman is on the call and he will give us a brief introduction to her, to her shortly. I think most of you already know her, but it's always nice to reintroduce and get reacquainted with Sue. It's been um, a pleasure speaking to her over the last couple of days by, while we got ready for this webinar. So a couple of housekeeping notes. I had to mention this before we start that we will send you a recording of the web webinar within um, the next week. There is a fashion button down there. The reason why it's important for you to um, notice it is because if you have any questions, you cannot send them to Sue. You cannot send them to anyone else, but Dr. Sarmit and myself, Aramide Boatswain, um, and I'm in charge of marketing for um, Zoran Technologies, will be able to answer those questions and pass them on. If there are questions that Dr. Sarmit can answer immediately, he will send you a response. Otherwise, we will interrupt Sue very politely and have her speak more to the question at hand. Of course, there will be moments where she will take pauses and ask questions as well, but we'll get through as many of them as we can within the hour that we have together. Of course, there's always more information available at vetcat.com. If the information is not there, Dr. Simon is very passionate about making sure that we get the answers to you somehow through eBlast or in the, on the website at some point, or maybe via another webinar in the near future. So without much ado, the reason we're here today is for a webinar with Dr. Sue. David, would you like to introduce her? Dr. McTaggart, thank you for uh, taking the time to put this presentation together and to being um, with us tonight. Uh, Dr. McTaggart um, works on the um, island of uh, Vancouver. She is a fellow of the Academy of Veterinary Dentistry and I've had the pleasure to know her for um, some time now, but a bit more for the past uh, year, roughly, since she started to uh, use uh, three-dimensional radiography, the VETCAT CT in her practice. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Sue, please, go ahead. All right, hello, everybody. Thanks for being here, eight o'clock at the end of a possibly work day for a lot of you. And I'm very excited to be here and you'll see why in a minute. So, um, but before I start, I would like to say unreservedly and wholeheartedly how much a fan I am of Dr. David Sarment, the inventor of this equipment for veterinarians. And um, I'll tell you why. Dr. Sarment's a periodontist with experience on the human side and when I share a case with him, which is pretty much every week, he's able to share with me how humans feel with the same malady or condition. And his experience and research is also a support in sharing ideas on how to approach cases. So everybody knows Peter Emily. He got us started as, as a human dentist. And now David Sarment's here for us too. So I hope you don't mind, David. I just had to say that. So... I've had the vet cat since May of 2019 and in a previous webinar, several participants wanted to know the size. So I included this photo with myself and Greg who came to set it up for us. And the other question people have is how long it takes to obtain a scan. And basically it's 20 seconds of scanning and another minute for the data to appear. So I'm going to now present some cases where the surgical approach to a lesion or the treatment plan were guided by the three-dimensional imaging ability of the cone beam CT. So the first case is Taco, 16 months, domestic short hair, male neutered, swelling of the right maxilla. Can everybody see my pointer? And it, uh, this cat had a persistent 507 deciduous tooth, which had been extracted by the referring veterinarian. 
So there were two healing incisions. Uh, one was for the extraction site of 507, and then the other one was where they had attempted to extract the embedded tooth that they'd seen on that two-dimensional radiograph. And here is the two-dimensional radiograph. It's a lateral bisecting angle. And there you see tooth 107. So the adult tooth is embedded. This is another dorsal ventral two-dimensional view which shows the embedded tooth from another perspective. That's about the best you can do with two-dimensional. Whereas when you do your cone beam, in this axial cone beam view, you can actually measure the distance from the palate to the embedded tooth. And if you click on a spot and draw a line, it will give you an actual measurement without the need for any calculations or conversion. So this coronal view, view allowed me to measure from a clinical location, which was a distal aspect of tooth 104. So my surgical approach was perfectly situated over the embedded tooth by triangulating the two measurements. This three-dimensional view gives a real feel for the surrounding structures and a good picture of where this tooth sits beneath the bone. So you can see it on there. You can, you can turn these heads around, move them any way you like. Here's another one where we're looking from the inside across the mouth. You can actually take a cut and look at the 3D and there it is there. And then in this cross-sectional view, three-dimensional, you can plan your extraction because here the orientation of the crown was obvious. And it's a bit like delivering a baby and being able to see the crown ahead of time. So there it is. So the tooth has been extracted via window in the buccal bone guided by the cone beam measurements. And there's some air density that's apparent post extraction there. So the osteotomy defect can be seen in this coronal view. Six weeks later, Taco returned for follow-up and we were able to obtain another cone beam scan. And now you can see that the cyst is reduced in size. We also were able to do a comparison where on the left, this cone beam scan shows the osteotomy defect it was created in order to extract the embedded tooth. And on the right, there's evidence that the defect is healing. And this was a few months later. So I really like to be able to show that to the owner and for myself. So Taco gets to keep her face thanks to the ability to delicately approach an embedded tooth guided by the cone beam. Anybody got any questions yet? No, okay, well, we're gonna keep going. So here's Mira, three-year-old spayed female domestic short hair. She had inflammation only on the left side and there had been no improvement with repeated use of Medicam and antibiotics. So the lips were quite enlarged on the left and there was caudal left-sided mucositis, accumulation of plaque on the caudal cheek teeth only on the left and furcation exposure grade three of tooth 208. The typical two-dimensional radiograph does not correlate well with the clinical picture of vacation exposure grade three involving tooth 208. The mandibular two-dimensional radiographs are a bit more revealing. I used to think two dimensions was perfectly revealing for mandibular pathology. However, in another case coming up, I'm gonna illustrate how two-dimensional radiographs of the mandible fail to show significant lesions which become apparent on a cone beam scan. So 
So here we've got an axial view showing bone loss involving the left orbit, and 208 and 209 have been extracted. So there's where you can see some bone loss. And it becomes more extensive as you scan distally through the images. And then as you keep going back, the mandibular lesions appear. Osteomyelitis of the left maxilla was diagnosed based on the radiographic appearance. The distance through the alveolus to the floor of the orbit is just five millimeters. So an accurate measurement can be obtained, as mentioned earlier, simply by drawing a line connecting two points. So that I find very exciting. This three-dimensional view obtained immediately post-extraction of 208 shows the anatomy of the alveolar margins. And the, the left is on our right, and the cat's facing us. So you can see the mesial roots, you can see the distal root. And I know when I was first learning how to do extractions, I used to fall into this area and think I used to think I was in the alveolus. And I think this would be a wonderful teaching tool to show the students and the practitioners just that uh, they've got to be very careful when they go for that distal route. Don't go down the center where there tends to be the odd artery. So we're now behind the cat and the lesions are on our left. And the bone loss due to osteomyelitis and periosteitis is evidence as pits on the floor of the orbit. So Mira returned later for extraction of the remaining left cheek teeth and her condition has resolved. And the cone beam CT views revealing the severity of the osteomyelitis changed my treatment plan. I prescribed longer term antibiotics and a radiographic follow up sooner than I otherwise would have. The owner was also much more motivated both to administer the antibiotics and to return for follow up. And that's the part I really like about it. I can do a better job because the people will come back. Any questions yet? Yeah, there was a question here, um, Dr. McTaggart, about this um, case. You, you were talking about this distance to the floor of the orbit. Can you tell us how you've changed your technique maybe or what, what uh, what exactly is happening now that you're able to do this, this measurement ahead of the, the extraction? Well, I certainly know how far not to go. And uh, it just gives me a good idea. If I put a probe in there, I know where there's an essential structure. So it, it probably makes me a little more careful than I used to be. Also, if the floor of the orbit is eroded, then I'm a little bit more careful when I'm doing curatage of that alveolus because I don't want to be scooping up into the orbit. Mm -hmm. So has anyone else maybe got something they want to offer? Yeah, that's a very good point. And then on that second case, you were mentioning that you were uh, uh, treating the patient uh, differently in terms of antibiotics. Are you... Um, a bit more aggressive with with the prescription or you, are you prescribing for a longer period of time? Well, I'm always aggressive with the prescription, but it's mostly it's for a longer period of time because I know it's going to take a little longer for the bone to close that up, heal and remodel. Mm -hmm. So I guess it, it's just a, a more extensive lesion than I ever would have thought. And I mean, when I was going to vet school, I was taught that if you put a cat in the same room with its fracture, it will heal. But uh, when I see this on the cone beam, I, I do still get a little bit worried. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. 
So this is Lily, the four-year-old spayed female domestic short hair, and she was presented for ongoing stomatitis. And I know all the veterinary dentists in this group, you know, you hear this all the time, they, they call it stomatitis. Anyway, she was treated using antibiotics and prednisone. Um, there was no mucositis. A diagnosis of stomatitis requires, as we all know, both gingivitis and mucositis. However, there was periodontal disease easily detected clinically. And this again shows that the two-dimensional radiograph of the cat maxilla will not reveal furcation defects due to overlap by the zygomatic arch. And uh, you can lower the angle of the x-ray beam and that might assist you, but still no cigar. So here we are, and in this cat, we did the measurement and you can see there, it's only three millimeters. So I'm gonna enjoy using this tool to teach practitioners and students to take care during extractions. That's not very far. And again, the 3D images show the perforations in the bone of the orbital floor due to the dental disease. So the ears uh, had been itchy. And so whenever we do a comb beam, if it's, it's because I'm doing dentistry, I still like to look at the ears and the temporomandibular joints. And I have found a few things that way. And this was used in this cat to rule out lesions. So you can see the entire otic system as well as the temporomandibular joints. So here's, look, look at our bullas there, you know, and you've got the two compartments in the cat. This is my dog, Norm, who we were talking about earlier. He works at the clinic and he also works out. Okay, here's LT, 12 year old male neutered domestic short hair. The owner felt that he had pain. And he'd recently been, uh, she, she'd been running everywhere trying to find the pain in this cat. And a very good veterinary dentist had recently extracted teeth suffering from tooth resorption. And we found uh, that the symphysis was lax and there was dorsal displacement of the right mandible, which is really easy to see. So this is the right side here. And then the 3D shows the displacement and it's quite minor. I mean, there's just minor displacement of it. So obviously we figure there's been an injury at some time, previous injury. And my thought was, I wonder if it's a temporomandibular joints. And I sent this off to a radiologist and uh, also David looked at it to see if they thought that this might be a cause of this cat's pain. And here's where, David, I'd like you to jump in to show how a human dentist can help us with this sort of thing. According to the radiologist, the spaces were narrowed, but they can't say definitively that that's the cause of its pain. So David, do you wanna jump in? Sure, yes, briefly. So that, that space, of course, is um, um, narrowing and very small to start with. So you, you do need the high resolution and really zoom in to see the joint and whether it's there at all or, uh, or if it's completely gone. If it's completely gone, if you cannot identify any space, of course, that's an indication for uh, at least an area of resorption in the disc. We also look for the reg regularity of that joint and one of those sides here shows a difference. And when you have, um, we have actually a tool on the software to uh, put the two TMJs next to each other in order to um, look for symmetry. But you can see here how you're starting to lose the regularity of the shape of the, of the combine. And of course you can have a, a resorptive lesion on the condyle itself, at which point you can start to see um, the, the loss of structure and the loss of uh, cortical bone. Yeah, and I, and one of the things you'd mentioned to me was that in people, they rely very much on their sense of pain. Yes, on, on people, in, in many ways, temporal medical disorder is an easy diagnosis because Patients walk in with pain in their joints and it's very obvious. They will describe 
the sort of pain, the, the length of the pain during the day, whether they wake up with it or not, and so on. So um, yeah. the exact um, um, occurrence, you need imaging for it, but the diagnosis is actually much easier on, on humans. Yeah, so... David, would you use the 0 0.07 setting for that resolution there, or is that too much detail? Well, that's a good point, actually. In, is, um, it's possible to um, sort of bring up the resolution to uh, 70 microns in areas of interest. It would actually be um, valuable to do this sort of a box around one of the joints or on each joint and look for that uh, look for the, the space at that sort of resolution because you do need that sort of detail uh, on cats that have such a small anatomy. Right. Well, knowing the thought that possibly there was a dislocation or an injury to the symphysis and this cat may have had a fall or whatever, we did want to rule out TMJ luxation, subluxation, degenerative joint disease, sclerosis, and cysts. And so we were able to do some rule outs. Um, we did put the cat on Medicam, but the owner says it didn't make any difference. And I was also going to ask whether or not anti-inflammatories, you would expect to see a response as, as a way of diagnosing that they simply have pain there. Nobody know? Anyway, look, we'll keep moving on. So uh, we also ruled out uh, problems in the ear canals. And again, I love to see the two chambers in the bullas. And, and uh, I'm planning to hang out with Munir and learn more about the ear and use my cone to paint more that way. So here's my dog, Norm, working at the clinic. He's got a stethoscope on. He's, he's always ready to work. All right, here's Gus. A 21-month-old domestic short hair, neutered male, and he presented for an embedded mandibular canine tooth, and he had an adoptive parent waiting for him. He's from the SPCA. And there we can see we've got missing 304. And there it is. So the veterinarian that first saw this decided that they ought to send it here. It obviously requires extraction, but where is it exactly in relation to the mandibular canal? So this axial cone beam image shows the lingual orientation of tooth 304. And this coronal image also shows that embedded tooth 304 lies on the lingual side of the mandibular canal. Here, you can draw a line through the embedded tooth and then you'll get the image that's on the right. And it shows the pericoronitis around the embedded crown and the alveolar bone encasing the apex, which I was pleased to see that. And then uh, this is just a fun image where the bone's been digitally peeled from the roots. David did this, it wasn't me. <laughs> showing a relationship of the roots with each other. And so tooth 407 is right here, and I extracted it as well. So here we have embedded tooth 304 and 307 successfully extracted with guidance from the cone beam images. And any other questions? Okay. Who's, who's the patient on this picture? <laughs> That's my son. <laughs> So this is Bravo, it's our first dog. Three-year-old male neutered pug, a sweetheart of a little dog, bilateral oroantral fistulas. So some right maxillary teeth had recently been extracted by the referring veterinarian, but the flap had dehissed. So tissues had retracted and they were scarred. And I just put this in here just to show how we all know it's difficult to position a dental x-ray cone and get 2D image of the right maxilla in a pug. It's basically over the right eye, and this is what you get. So this axial view, cone beam view, reveals loss of palatal bone. 
And this is a necrotic section of palatal bone that was removed from the dehist extraction site. And I was left with soft tissue and an oroantral fistula. And on the other side, the story was the same, except the tissues had not yet been manipulated. Here's a two-dimensional view of the left maxilla. And it was an extensive fistula on that side. More necrotic palatal bone from the left. And it's all sutured up. And this is what came back three months later. I just saw the dog a couple days ago because I closed it up again. And, and this, I've had success on the side that had never been touched before. And I had a little more work to do on this side. But I was actually pleased. So here we're comparing the cone beams from the first time I saw it to the second time. So the first and here's the second. So look at the amount of bone and remodeling that we have obtained. So it's amazing what you can see three months later. And then on the left is a three-dimensional from February 28 and on the right three months later. Again, you can see where it was all eroded there and now we're getting some bone growth. And a close-up of it shows on the left initially and then some of the bone coming back. So Bravo's got a new lease on life. He really is a, a new dog. I mean, I'm sure we've all heard that story. And I was able to motivate the owners to come for rechecks by showing how much bone loss there was on the cone beam and how we are getting regrowth. So they came from quite far away and it was nice to be able to motivate them. So here is my clinic in a rowing regatta and Norm was part of it. He was the coxswain. Mm. So here's Sandy. Uh, the there, was a, there was a question um, actually about the, uh, the, the previous case with the embedded uh, tools there. Yes. Um, you were mentioning the proximity to the lingual plate and, uh, and to the nerve. So did, how did this uh, information change your surgical approach? To, to removing the tooth. So I was able to triangulate. You're talking about the lingual. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, we know that there's a very, very short distance to the floor of the or orbit. And you're thinking of palatal side? Is uh, what you mean? The, the question had to do with that lingual, um, th that mandibular canine. That's, oh, that, was, that uh, one, was, yes. Okay. showed. And the proximity to the lingual. Ah, yes, yes. Um, so, so I knew that the safest approach was to go down and luxate that tooth on the lingual side, staying well away from the mandibular canal. And I also knew that I had a nice apex. I didn't have to worry about pushing that tooth anywhere and not necessarily pushing it into the mandibular canal itself, which is everybody's nightmare. So I just really worked hard on the lingual side and worked my way around the tooth and stayed away from the buccal side. Does that answer the question? Yes, 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 very good. Thank you so much. Okay. So here's Sandy, 12-year-old Yorkie cross, spade female, uh, with a fractured right mandible. And sometimes it, it's a worry when people take dental courses and they learn to remove bone and th this particular dog had had the buccal and lingual bone removed uh, tooth 408 and, and the jaw fractured when it went home. So there's what I saw. Mandible had not healed. So this is a two-dimensional radiograph of my repair and uh, I'm going to thank David for his assistance in organizing these images but uh, you can see the before, and this is before, another view, and then after. Um, you know, it, it looked a lot better, a lot more apposition, and so I was satisfied with that. Sandy is seen here post-surgery wearing a tape muzzle and went on to have a functional jaw. 
but I'm going to use this case in teaching to really motivate the people. Maybe they don't need to remove a lot of buccal and lingual bone. Maybe they could just trough around with a nice little fine diamond burr, long diamond burr. So this is my son and myself at a swim meet when he was seven years old. And this is my son, the same son and me recently on a trip to Cuba together. And it's just amazing how they grow up. Mm -hmm. So here's Alfie, eight-year-old Sheltie neutered male, referred for a mandibular periapical lucency that was noted not by the veterinarian who was doing dentistry on this dog when they were cleaning the teeth. They didn't actually radiograph the entire mouth, but the dog had a chest problem and they decided to x-ray the chest and send it to a radiologist and the radiologist saw the lucency up in the corner. So that's a case for doing full mouth extractions. So I'm sorry, full mouth x-rays. <laughs> Remember earlier I talked about two dimensional views of the mandible not revealing all of the pathology. So here's our two dimensional view of this. And now you can see on the 3D a little fenestrations here. And you can see the defect. Those were not visible on the two dimensional. So I was just blown away by the ability of the cone beam imaging to show a lesion like that. And up until now, I was under the impression that imaging of the maxilla was better with cone beam, but that two dimensional was just fine for the mandible. So the lesion and its relationship to the mandibular canal can easily be seen in this axial cone beam view. And the lesion was not bilateral. Contralateral tooth 409 appears to be normal. So tooth 309 was extracted and the root was sent to Cindy, Cindy Bell for analysis because I suspected a periapical cyst and she's doing a study of that a specific pathology. But it wasn't. It was diagnosed as apical hypercementosis. And uh, this is most commonly, she said, seen in middle-aged um, African people. And so I don't know how that correlates in the dogs. I don't think it's very common. So here's Norm preparing to work at a seminar about bees. Mm -hmm. Here's Murphy, four-year-old male neutered cockapoo. He was referred for an oral nasal fistula at distal 104. And a year ago, a stick had been removed from that area and it is, they thought it had healed. And a month ago, Murphy was examined for sneezing and they cleaned the mouth and they found a pocket distal to 104 and they were able to cause fluid to escape from the nares when the defect was flushed. So there's a nine millimeter pocket distal 104 along with three millimeters of gingival recession. The extent of the pocket and bone loss were difficult to determine clinically. However, when saline exited from the nares on flushing, we knew it was serious. And the palatal appearance clinically was unremarkable. The two dimensional radiographs of 104 underestimated the serious pathology that existed. Look at what this fistula has done to the right nasal passage. Hmm. You can now appreciate the bone loss distal and palatal to tooth 104. And as you start to move distally through the images, you can see the extent of the nasal changes. And at the level of distal 104, the bone loss appears. So here on the right is 104 and 204 is on the left. So it's really nice to be able to compare the right and left with the sagittal views. Calculus is visible on the root. And the palatal side of 104, that's the hidden lesion. So the cone beam CT scan 
revealed an oral nasal fistula that was not evident on the two-dimensional radiograph. And if that vet that referred it hadn't probed carefully, this serious lesion would have gone undetected. So I actually think routine scans reveal lesions that otherwise may go unnoticed. So I'm going to give you the last case now. There was and a this question is before, you, before you go to the last case. Um, you sort of touched on it right on that last uh, slide, and that has to do with your um, habit now that you've done this for some for a little time your, your routine do you um scan every patient now because of this sort of lesions that you discover on the on the ct or what is your sort of protocol in the office okay you, we it? we offer the ct to any animal coming into this clinic that is going to get an anesthetic and we always ask the people has your dog or cat ever had an ear problem so that helps us to motivate the people towards that. It gets all those ones. I offer it to every single animal getting an anesthetic. And if there are, is pathology like in previous ear problem or we're suspicious of something, it's even easier to talk them into it. We do it as an add-on in all our dentistries to our full mouth x-rays. Okay, thank you. So this is the last one. This is Charlie, and he's a five-year-old male neutered Cocker Spaniel, and he was referred for periodontal disease. And this is a typical example of a dog that didn't seem to need to have a scan. He just needed some extractions, but we did a general screening like we we're just talking about, and I just put in here, when what to our wondering eyes did appear, it wasn't a miniature sleigh. Can you see that? And here it shows up on the left sagittal. It's not on the right sagittal in the same area. And the coronal view really shows it nicely. And I, I like it that I can, if I need to, send it for a very detailed radiology report. And I put this in here just to show the kind of details you can get. You can get, they'll look at the Hounsfield units of it to suggest what kind of density it is. And uh, they'll really give me an idea of what I should do. They're talking about it being expansile, so I need to talk to the owner. You, you really do need to come back. So, yes, new worlds have been opened up by my comb beam in all these areas that you can see. So, yeah, it's the Ferrari that I really don't, I'd rather have this. I'm glad I got this technology, and I want to thank Dr. Sarment for having got it going for us veterinarians and being there for us. And that's the end. Thank you very much. This was uh, just a, a beautiful presentation. Um, we're going to open the microphone to everyone uh, so that we can have um, maybe a few questions. And Remedy, if you can uh, unmute. Yes, I'm unmuting everyone right now. Okay, thank you. So everyone, I'm asking to unmute you because it's not allowing me to unmute you one at a time, but please feel free to come off mute if you have a question. We did go through quite a bit of slides um, and Dr. McTaggart is determined to answer every one of them you have. So we can always swing back to one that piqued your interest. I have a question while we have uh, people come on, online here. You, you. Um... You spent, uh, you, you, you do a routine where you re-image the patient if you can. What is your uh, routine doing that now? And was there any case where you um, had, a, you know, once you had looked at the follow-up scan, you went back and maybe um, retreated or addressed the case a little differently? Hmm.
I think with the the fracture one, it was very good. Any any time I've had a fracture, that really helps. I think there's the osteomyelitis. You're seeing how they are progressing. Whether you would need anti more antibiotics or not, are they doing all right? I think also that um, cyst, when we have cysts, I really love the follow-ups for any kind of a dentigerous cyst with embedded teeth. Is that cyst still there? Is the lining still active? Am I getting anywhere? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really, that's a very good point. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, you covered quite a bit of information, really. Uh, I, Thank you very much for putting those cases together and taking the time to organize them. I know it's a, it's a, a work to do that, but also um, uh, I have had a chance to work, you know, to see your progress and, and your work over many, many months. And I'm um, amazed how careful you are each step of the way. So it's been a real pleasure personally to Get to touch base with you on a weekly basis, actually, roughly. So it's been quite wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Amy, do you see any um, any questions coming up? A moment. Uh, oh, there it is. Can, can you hear me, David? This is Munir. Hi, Dr. Qureshi. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Good. Just have a quick uh, curiosity question. How often do you see a dental case come up with uh, ear pathology? Uh, I would say, you know, if you just want to get a rough idea off yeah. the top of my head, yeah. one in 20. Okay. And you sometimes, I actually, it's mostly in rabbits, you know, yeah. I've, I've done a lot of rabbits, and uh, sometimes I think they're linked. I think that the ear pathology and the dental pathology are one and the same. I've seen it go both ways. And until mm. we go after the ear, we we can't get the dental fixed, or the dental caused the ear problem. Hmm. Interesting. Mm. That is interesting. Yeah. Uh, Munir, what would you say... Um about the other way around, since you see uh, ear pathology only, have you, incidentally, you find quite a bit of dental disease, I suppose. Um, that's a good question, David. As you know, uh, once I'm into the ears, I focus very closely on the ears and dentistry gets on the side. So um, we are not heavily into dentistry and which, that is, you know, that's a big, big issue. Um, there is, you know, obviously ear case and dental cases, sometimes they go together and, and we do deal with it, but patient comes with the ears and we kind of concentrate more on ears um, and not as much on the dentistry. I have shared some of the cases with you, but there are not as many. Mm. I'm, I'm tempted because I, I've seen uh, cases from various uh, practitioners, I'm tempted to have a, a vet cat, uh, you know, a sort of centralized area where different specialties can look at cases from other specialists, mainly for that reason, actually, because they're, yes. we tend yes. to look at the world with our own eyes, you know? Yes, that would be very helpful, that's for sure. Yeah. That's a, that's a good one. Thank you for that question. Sure. Thank you. That was wonderful, uh, Dr. McTar. Well, thank you. <clears throat> well, I think we've uh, covered all the questions here. Uh, that I, um, I, I'd like to thank you again for this beautiful presentation. It was really very, very, very interesting. And we could feel the, the passion and the care for your patients all along. It's, it's, it's been a real pleasure to, to have you tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. McTar. Yep. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, both of you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Hey, thank you. It was wonderful. I learned a lot. Who's that? That's Jim.
Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Thanks, I had, Jim. I had, I had no idea that much bone would grow back on a rescan. So that's my big oh. aha for tonight. Oh, okay. Thanks, Sue. Oh, well, thank thanks, you. Sue. Hey. Well, thank thanks, you, everyone. Sue. It's Molly. I didn't even Hi. know they would let one of these things go to Canada. <laughs> I have the first one. <laughs> I knew you're the first at everything, Sue. Oh, and the last. <laughs> First well, and last. <laughs> but thank you everyone for joining us tonight. As always, this is supposed to be a forum where we can share and exchange our best practices using the VetCat. Of course, it's a way for us to see what you would like to hear more about. And we are always constantly de developing that archive of knowledge to support you with your VetCat. So thank you for joining us tonight. And we look forward to seeing you on the next VetCat webinar. Have a good evening. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.